Gary Leon Ridgway was born on February 18, 1949, in Salt Lake City, Utah. His parents, Mary Rita Ridgway and Thomas Newton Ridgway, had three sons. Gary was the middle son in the family. His mother Mary was a very domineering woman, which would result in many violent arguments between his parents. Gary Ridgway would have various issues at a young age. He would have problems wetting his bed up until he was a teenager. This would constantly anger his mother. He would wash his genitals every time he would have this accident. His father, Thomas Ridgway, was a bus driver who would often complain about the presence of prostitutes on his bus run. Gary Ridgway would grow to have conflicting feelings of anger and sexual attraction towards his mother, and he would often fantasize about killing her. Ridgway had trouble while in high school. He was dyslexic and was held back a year. Gary Ridgway had a below average IQ of 82. The first signs of Gary Ridgway's homicidal ways was when he was only 16 years old. At that time, he led a young boy into the woods and then stabbed him through the ribs, right into the liver. The young victim would survive the stabbing. He would later state that Gary Ridgway walked away laughing after stabbing him. In 1969, after graduating high school, Gary Ridgway joined the United States Navy. He would also marry his girlfriend Claudia Barrows before going to Vietnam. Gary Ridgway stated that he had an insatiable appetite for sex. During his time in the military, he would have unprotected sex with prostitutes. He eventually contacted several STDs, which would anger him, but it didn't stop him from continuing to have unprotected sex. His marriage to Claudia Barrows would eventually end in divorce. As time went on, Gary Ridgway married Marsha Winslow in 1973, and in 1975, the couple had Gary Ridgway's first and only child, a son named Matthew Ridgway. During his second marriage, Gary Ridgway became consumed in religion. He would walk around reading the Bible and preaching to his wife how to live a strict life set to religious beliefs. This was also at the same time that Gary Ridgway wanted his wife Marcia to have sex several times a day. He also wanted to have sex outdoors and in appropriate places. Gary Ridgway would also hide the secret that he continued to pay prostitutes for unprotected sex throughout his second marriage. His wife Marcia had weight issues during their marriage, and she eventually had gastric bypass surgery. Because of this weight loss, men started to find her attractive. This made Gary Ridgway extremely jealous and insecure. This would also cause the couple to fight constantly and would lead to the end of their marriage. In 1985, Gary Ridgway began dating Judith Mawson, who would eventually become his third wife in 1988. Judith thought of Ridgway as a gentle, responsible, and structured man. Little did she know of the cold, dark secrets that Gary Ridgway had hidden from her. On July 15th in 1982, children would stumble upon a body floating in the Green River in King County, Washington. The victim, was 16-year-old Wendy Lee Cofield. She would be Gary Ridgway's first victim. Cofield was strangled to death with her own panties and tossed into the shallow edge of the river. On August 12, 1982, Frank Linear discovered the body of 23-year-old Deborah Lynn Bonner. Her body was floating in the Green River, only yards from the Kent Slaughterhouse where Linear worked. On August 15, 1982, three more bodies would be discovered. 31-year-old Marcy Chapman was found in the shallow water. She was laying alongside the naked body of 17-year-old Cynthia Hens. Nearby the two bodies, in the undergrowth, lay the partially nude body of 16-year-old Opal Mills. Blue trousers were knotted around her neck, with bruises apparently on her arms and legs. The body count started to pile up. King County had a serial killer who was butchering young females. The victims ranged in ages from 12 years old to 31 years old. Skeletal remains were constantly being discovered clustered together in wooded areas along the Green River. Most of the victims were left nude, sometimes their fingernails clipped. The locations where the bodies were discovered were sometimes littered with gum or cigarette butts. 
food and roadmaps. Some of the dead bodies had been sexually abused. The Green River Task Force was formed to investigate the murders and the list of possible suspects grew. DNA was not a thing during the early 1980s. The Green River Task Force basically had to rely on good old fashioned police work to piece together clues to track down the serial killer. They had no solid leads on who the Green River Killer was. Public frustration was mounting. In 1982, Gary Ridgway was questioned after he was caught in his truck with a prostitute. It was later discovered that the prostitute was Kelly McGinnis. Ridgway would later admit to murdering McGinnis. Her body has never been found. Ridgway was questioned again in 1983 after the boyfriend of a prostitute who went missing identified Ridgway's truck as the last truck his girlfriend had gotten into right before she vanished. Gary Ridgway was soon on the police's radar, but they could not find anything to connect him to the murders. In October 1983, convicted serial killer Ted Bundy was sitting on death row in Florida. Bundy had been reading about the Green River Killer and saw lead detective David Reichert's photo in his stories. He offered to help the task force find their killer. Ted Bundy would write to Detective David Riker from his jail cell in Florida. Don't ask me why I believe I'm the expert in this area. Just accept that I am and we'll start from there. Riker flew to Florida with fellow investigator Robert Capel to meet with Ted Bundy. The information that Ted Bundy provided helped the investigators get into the mind of a killer. Ted Bundy would call the killer River Man. He said that the killer likely knew some of his victims. He also said more victims were probably buried in the dumping areas where victims had been found. Ted Bundy also put a lot of significance into the different areas the bodies had been left, suggesting that each cluster or spot was set closer to the killer's home. Bundy also advised authorities that the killer may also be revisiting his victims' corpses and performing sexual acts on them. This would be a hypothesis that Gary Ridgway would later confirm to be true. In 1984, Gary Ridgway was arrested for trying to solicit an undercover policewoman posing as a prostitute. He was brought in for questioning and agreed to take a polygraph test. Gary Ridgway passed the test, but he was still not out of the clear with the Green River Task Force. On April 8, 1987, the police searched Gary Ridgway's house. Sifting through the home was a major challenge for the detectives as it was tightly packed with objects that Gary Ridgway and his fiance had collected from dumpster diving, attending swap meets, and from visiting dump sites, many of the dump sites where some of the Green River victims had been found. Ridgway was taken into police custody where he once again passed the polygraph test. Gary Ridgway agreed to allow them to take hair samples and a saliva swab before he was released for lack of evidence. Gary Ridgway believed that he had once again fooled the Green River Task Force, and his confidence was riding high. Gary Ridgway was soon back on the prowl. He would go on undetected for many years. That was until 2001, when the Green River Task Force was made up of younger detectives, many of whom had been teenagers when the killings first began. This younger task force had the advantage of newer DNA research, which had advanced considerably over the last 15 years. DNA evidence had been carefully taken and preserved by the past task force from the victims. This DNA evidence was what led to the eventual identification of who the Green River Killer was. Gary Ridgway's saliva swab from 1987 would be the break that the Green River Task Force had long been waiting for. After 14 years, the DNA from that swab was a positive match to the Green River murder victims Marsha Chapman, Opal Mills, Cynthia Hens, and Carol Ann Christensen. Worried that there was a good chance that DNA could confuse a jury, lead detective David George Reichert wanted more evidence against Gary Ridgway. It wasn't until 1988 that DNA evidence actually sent someone to jail but Reichert wanted it to be a guaranteed open and shut case against Ridgway. Detective Reichert interviewed Gary Ridgway's ex-wives and old girlfriends and discovered that Ridgway had taken one girlfriend for picnics and outdoor sex in various areas he had used to dump the bodies of his victims. Additional forensic links to Gary Ridgway was spray paint found on the clothing of six of his victims, which matched various paints collected at Ridgway's job. 
Gary Ridgway knew he would be facing execution and opted for a plea bargain to spare his life. Ridgway agreed to fully cooperate with the investigation into the remaining Green River murders. Detectives would get gruesome details and recollections of each of the heinous murders that Gary Ridgway had committed right from the man himself. Ridgway would take detectives to locations where he left bodies, disclosing how he had killed each one of his victims. He also talked about the evidence he left in the areas of the dumped bodies to throw detectives off. Ridgway killed most of his victims inside of his home, the same home he shared with his wife and sometimes young son. Most of the other victims would be killed in the woods. Ridgway used various techniques towards luring his victims. He would often use a picture of his young son to help gain the trust of his victims. He admitted to killing one of his victims while his son was waiting in the truck for him. Gary Ridgway would later admit that he would have killed his own son had his son realized what he was doing. During a taped confession, Ridgway, who was cold and void of any emotion whatsoever, confessed to killing 61 women. And in another taped confession, he would say that he killed upwards of 71 women total. Gary Ridgway would also confess to planting body parts of his victims in the state of Oregon in order to throw off the investigation. Ridgway would also confess that he targeted prostitutes because they were easy to pick up and that he hated most of them. And much like what Ted Bundy had predicted, Gary Ridgway confessed that he had sex with the victims' bodies after he murdered them, but claimed he began burying the later victims so that he could resist the urge to commit necrophilia. He also confessed to returning to the scenes of his crimes to have sex with six of the bodies of his victims. Detective Reichert would later tell the New York Times about the mindset of Gary Ridgway, stating, First off, there's no remorse. He doesn't have any feelings towards anybody, his family included. And that's what I saw in Ted Bundy, and that's what I see in Ridgway. Mr. Ridgway craved the attention and control, and was prideful when discussing his killings. When detectives presented him with an unsolved murder to see if he would confess to it, he told them, why? If it isn't mine? Because I have pride in it, in what I do. I don't want to take it from anybody else. It is believed that Gary Ridgway is responsible for over 100 homicides. Ridgway would eventually only recall 48 murders. And on November 2, 2003, Gary Ridgway pled guilty to 48 charges of aggravated first-degree murder. He was sentenced on December 18, 2003 to 480 years without the possibility of parole. Gary Ridgway is now 74 years old and is currently serving his life sentence at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington.